Hello, and welcome to our virtual program. Is militarization essential for security in 2022 and beyond? Thanks everybody for joining us. I'm Joel Rosenthal, president of Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. And our conversation today is prompted by a book symposium in the most recent issue of Ethics and International Affairs Journal. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Ethics and International Affairs is a quarterly journal published by Carnegie Council and Cambridge University Press. The journal consists of essays, peer-reviewed articles, and book reviews, all of which make the elusive connection between ethical reflection and the practice of international affairs. You can view the journal anytime through the Carnegie Council website or the Cambridge University Press website. The symposium we're discussing today is provocatively titled Ethics, Security, and the War Machine. The title comes from Ned DeBose's new book, which has an equally suggestive subtitle, The True Costs of the Military. Now, fortunately, we have Ned with us to tell us more about the book. Uh, Ned is zooming in from the future, uh, all the way from Canberra, where it's already tomorrow. Um, Ned, thanks for getting up early. Uh, we also have Nita Crawford, scholar, teacher, longtime contributor to the journal and friend of Carnegie Council. And Nita's essay in the symposium is titled Democracy and the Preparation and Conduct of War. And to complete our panel, we have Elliot Ackerman, who recently spoke to Carnegie Council about his book, 2034. Many of you will know Elliot through his works of both fiction and nonfiction on issues relating to war, technology, and the future of national security. Now this fall marked 20 years since the 9-11 attack. It also marked the withdrawal of US forces from Afghanistan. It's rare to have a moment so clearly transitional. One can sense one chapter closing and another opening. As we consider various futures, this seems like the right time to ask some basic questions about the changing nature of war, peace, and national security. Despite revolutionary new technologies and changing geopolitics, old concepts remain in circulation. First among them is the question, are we on the brink of a new Cold War? And regardless of your answer, it seems that the national security state and those involved in national security are ready to step into the breach. And perhaps this is already happening. So many questions follow. Will our future become increasingly militarized? And should it? Do Americans, for example, want space force guardians in the Pentagon? What about a cyber force? And will new technologies like artificial intelligence and cryptocurrency become weaponized? These are just some of the questions on my mind as we think about the future. Now, Ned's book is about the costs of what he calls war building. So perhaps we can kick off with some comments from him and then to the panel. So again, thank you all for joining us. I hope this frames the conversation in a useful way. And I'm now going to turn to Ned to uh, kick us off with maybe some reflections on how you see the national security picture today. Sure. Thank you, Joel. Thanks for having me here. Um, I might start just by saying a little something about what was going through my head when I decided to, to pursue this project. My background is very much in, in just war theory and the philosophy of uh, philosophy and ethics of war. Um, and we, we look at the circumstances under which recourse to war might be justified. And the assumption tends to be that as long as there are some circumstances under, war, under which war is justified, then it must be, it must be permiss permissible to prepare for that eventuality. Uh, it just occurred to me that that's, that's faulty reasoning, that there are all sorts of things where uh, we can imagine circumstances where it's permissible to do it, but we don't think it's therefore permissible to prepare for it or, or to institutionalize it much less. So I take it, uh, you, you could describe a scenario in which 
most people would agree that torture would be justified, for example, if I really, uh, you know, there's a ticking time bomb scenario, you've got to torture the terrorists in order to get this information, it'll save a million people, it will definitely work and so on and so forth. And most people will kind of accept that in those sorts of circumstances, maybe it's justified to torture the terrorists, but should we therefore have uh, a department of torture with with taxpayer funded torture facilities and a torture industrial complex and so on. And I think people would be reluctant to go that far. So the permissibility of the act of war does not entail the permissibility of preparing for war. Okay, so the, the, the project was really me thinking through that and identifying all of all of the reasons we might have not to prepare for war, not to, to invest in this particular institution. Um, there are all sorts of costs, financial and non-financial costs. Uh, and there's also a range of circumstances where uh, militarization actually makes us less secure. It's, it's a, it can be a self-defeating institution. Uh, so cases where militarization compromises our security. Uh, I, I like to throw these hypotheticals out there and uh, here's one that I've that I've used occasionally. So imagine you're about to go into this into this gathering where there are uh, several violent criminals uh, and they're prepared to use violence to get their hands on your property. Before you enter, I offer you a, a gun for self-protection. On the face of it, it seems prudent to accept the weapon in this scenario. You can deter and fend off the aggressors. But now I suppose I give you some more information. Uh, aside from these violent criminals, there'll also be some highly paranoid delusional types. Uh, and they don't want your property, but if they see you as a threat, they'll come after you. Um, is it still prudent for you to accept the weapon in this scenario? And suddenly it's, it's not so clear. It's granted, if you openly carry the the gun into the gathering, well, that will have a deterrent effect uh, on the murderous bandits that want your property. Uh, at the same time, however, openly carrying the, the weapon makes you a target for the highly paranoid types. Uh, they're not interested in your property, but they are serious about neutralizing the threats that they perceive, and the weapon in your hand puts you squarely in that category. So this obviously complicates the decision considerably. It might still be prudent to accept the weapon. It might not be, it depends on so many other variables. Um, but the point is in scenarios like this, we can't generalize confidently that going in armed is the prudent thing to do. Being defenseless might actually increase your chances of survival as paradoxical as that may sound. And something is true, something similar is true, I think in, in international relations. At the very least, we could say militaries don't make an unequivocally positive contribution to natural, national security in the way that, that we imagine. It's, it's, it's much more of a trade-off. They make us more secure in some ways, less secure in other ways. To that, you, could, you add the fact that militaries are enormously costly institutions, and not just financially, but morally, socially, culturally. And to that, you add the fact that uh, whatever tasks we assign to the military, they're not guaranteed to pull them off. Uh, they're, not, they're not guaranteed to succeed. And we've learned that from the recent Afghanistan withdrawal. Put all those things together, I think we need to have serious conversations about uh, whether and the extent to which these institutions are justified in existing, notwithstanding the fact that there are some circumstances under which their use is justified and legitimate. Great. What a, what a great way to kick off. There's a lot in there to get to. Um, let me go to Nita. Nita, so tell me, how do you think about sort of right-sizing, if you will? So Ned did say that there are some, you know, legitimate uses and, and needs, right, for, for military force. Uh, and yet there seems to be some kind of, some kind of line which, which we cross where it becomes almost sort of self-justified or self-defeating. How, how do you think about that, that conundrum? Well, I believe that military force is justified for self-defense, and that's basically it. And um, sometimes you could use military force in defense of others. So then if you have a national security state, for example, like Australia, the US, Canada, um, the NATO members, 
what you have is uh, an institution which is capable of much more than self-defense. It's capable of off offensive uses of force, taking and holding territory, the same with China and Russia. And if states were to move toward a non-offensive defense posture or a, at least reduce their forces, they would be less likely to be in a security dilemma. So I think that um, what is prudent is to reduce the provocative, as a first step, the provocative elements of a force posture. For instance, nuclear weapons that are, whose basically uh, only plausible use is in first strike, right? So you, you, you don't have first strike nuclear weapons, uh, you reduce the capability to project power abroad. And that would entail for almost every country reducing its military forces. And then uh, you set it up so that uh, what you have is the capacity for true self-defense, that your borders are the boundaries for the projection of power. Um, so that, that is a long-term um, vision, getting from here to there. And a former colleague, Randy Forsberg, has written eloquently about that. Uh, she has a book that was published posthumously about moving toward a world without war. But I think that the, the key here is to keep in mind that the legitimate uses of force being self-defense, you have to start re-envisioning the entire force posture to see what it is that you have that, uh, what, that might be considered provocative as Ned says. Great, let me, uh, let me go to Elliot. Elliot, how do you respond to uh, this picture that's been painted? You're on mute. So sorry about that. I, um, I said, I think it sounds great. Um, you know, I, I hope you'll forgive me if I'm, I'm skeptical that, that this is a world in which we can live based off of uh, everything we know historically about human nature and how human beings behave in the face of scarcity. And scarcity is something that always exists in our world. And if we look at the... Um, you know, if we look at the just the, the recent history of warfare, uh, scarcity as well as power vacuums um, create a, a great deal of violence and embolden the worst actors uh, on this planet. So, you know, for instance, uh, a scenario where every nation would agree to limit its military expenditure and arming uh, only to a narrow sliver where it's capable of its for its own self-defense. I mean, akin to like the, you know, the Jap Japanese self-defense forces after the second world war, I think that would be fantastic. I would like to live in that world and would like to raise my children in that world. What I fear is that that consensus is not realistic because it, how does it necessarily account for bad actors and how does it account for individuals who, you know, exceed said limits. Um, so that being said as well, I, I, you know, and I've written very openly, uh, about the, the dangers of having militarized society. I mean, the United States is absolutely a militarized state. I think one of the, one of the worst outcomes of our 9-11 wars is that we have, we're not only a highly militarized state, we're also a militarized state that has been completely anesthetized to our projection of force overseas. And so much as we have a military that's composed of all volunteers and, and the vast majority of our war spending has been done through deficit spending. So there's been a war tax. So we are, many Americans are in many ways, not because they're bad people, but just because there is a security state that by design anesthetizes us to our wars. Uh, so I think that is very dangerous. I, you know, and I think that there are, is a very real conversation to be had about um, the militarization of our society and how we maintain that militarized posture. Uh, I just fear that when we, when we start veering into, uh, into certain utopian visions of what a world without war could look like, uh, oftentimes we have brought about the very wars we, we seek to avoid. Uh, avoid. Um, but I, I look forward to our, to our conversation. Nita, Nita, you look like you want to jump in there. Sure. I, yeah. there, there are three things I want to respond to. First right. of all, um, to argue that the world that we have, the, the, that we've created is safe, is that's the utopia, right? To, to suggest that more armaments 
uh, has brought us security in the past uh, or will always is uh, the kind of the searching for security that is elusive. Um, you know, then secondly, you began, Elliot, with the idea that human nature and scarcity are the culprits here. I, I believe that we don't really understand um, the potential for a different world because we haven't built it. What we have is a structure, and now we're on a path-dependent system, where what we have are systems that, that are designed to create insecurity in the other, to deter the other, right? So we can... Third, third point, move slowly, incrementally to a different way, right? I'm not saying, you know, we wake up tomorrow and um, we've, we've magically erased um, the capacity for aggressive forces. It has to be that we move to a different path through uh, treaties, through managed reductions, through development of institutions which provide for security, including economic institutions which help deal with the concerns for scarcity. So, it has to be a managed transition. But what I'm, I'm arguing is that the path we're on is not the path to security and it and, and basically hasn't ever been. And what we do is we, um, we hope that having uh, great might will make us feel and be secure. And often it leads to war. So I, I read um, uh, military history, world history quite differently. So yeah, let, let me let me pick up there. I'm I'm reminded that um, you know I'll, we'll just use the American example for the moment. Um, you know, through the World War II period, it was the Department of War, and we called it what it was. And then the the re the reform that came after we turned it into the Department of Defense. And um, as you were speaking, though, and, and maybe I'll I'll direct this first to Ned, um, because uh, you know you're talking about you know how we prepare as a society, what we're what we're you know what our what our aims are, what our missions are, what our goal is, and let's just presume that it is defense. Um, but there there seems to be where do you draw the line between offense and defense, right? I mean, in in in, in with the technology that we have today and the way the world is, I mean, is is it possible to to spin out a scenario like Nita was saying, where okay, we, we, our vision is defense. It ends at our borders, um, and then we go we go from there. Is that is that is that a realistic scenario? Um, it's there are very few weapons that I can think of which have purely defensive capabilities. So, um, uh, say a surface to air missile, where someone's encroaching on your territory, you can use that for for self-defense to, to fend them off. Uh, most weapons in any state's arsenal, even if we swear that we only intend to use them for defensive purposes, admit of some offensive capabilities. So that's why I think uh, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to design a military institution which has a defensive posture and whose defensiveness is completely transparent uh, to all adversaries and, and affected parties. So we might sincerely intend only to use our capabilities for defensive purposes. We might arrange things in such a way as to make it as clear as possible that we only intend to use these for national self-defense. But given the world is the way it is and uh, our intentions aren't, aren't completely uh, our intentions are opaque to one another. Uh, it's going to be hard to reassure all of our adversaries that we we would never think of using these uh, these capabilities offensively. And insofar as that's the case, insofar as most of what you find in any country's military arsenal does have offensive capability and must, uh, it, it's going to be very difficult to. Uh, avoid this kind of, to, it's gonna be very difficult to achieve what seems to be the ideal, which is we have a military force which deters, but it does not provoke. To me, that's fantasy. It, it's always going to do both. Elliot, can I, can I ask, yeah, please go ahead. I would just add that, uh, you know, we all might read the word differently. The greatest provocation that I have seen is weakness. Uh, and power vacuums. I mean, and time, time and again, when a, when a state 
projects weakness, which is another word for a power vacuum. Other actors move into that state. So I think again, there is like an Aristotelian median that you're that you're going for. On the one end, the overkill, which is a society is so hyper militarized that it is projecting a a offensive and threatening posture to others. But on the other side, just as much of a sin is to be so demilitarized that you are creating uh, the very conditions that would have a bad actor act out. And, and then we've seen, you know, and we've seen these types of scenarios through the long arc of history. I mean, we've seen this, this in, you know, recent U.S. involvements in the Middle East, uh, you know, time and time again, the danger of creating power vacuums. Um, and I would just offer, you know, kind of a, a broader observation, you know, when it comes to technology and war, I think there is a real danger in speaking about war to believe that uh, that technology in, in some way changes the fundamental nature of warfare and can seek to sanitize warfare for the actual participants. Um, you know, Clausewitz said in war, you know, the nature of war is slaughter. And um, so everything I, from my own experience, having, you know, having, having served many years uh, in the military uh, and, and fought in a couple of wars myself with, you know, with the luxury of having very, very high tech systems at my disposal um, on, you know, on many occasions, you know, the fight came down to two people in a house with rifles and pistols shooting it out with one another. Um, despite all of the drones that were in the air, intelligence systems, uh, automated, you know, automated bomb disposing robots, all of that. Um, I think if you look back at history and you look at how our systems, you know, at the end of the day, um, there is this very interpersonal nature of war, and uh, it's important not to allow ourselves to be seduced into believing that technology is going to disrupt that, because eventually the technology does start to bleed away, uh, and it comes down to this, you know, this intimate thing, which is what Klaus was said, slaughter. But, but Elliot, just on that for a second, but, but isn't a lot of the argument in terms of um, you know, procurement for armed forces and so on is the need to maintain technological edge, right? So, certainly, certainly. Right. Yeah. But the the idea, for instance, that uh, that technology sanitizes war is one that, in many cases, can lead to a our desire to have our war sanitized, our desire to be anesthetized to them, actually leads to the proliferation of war and oftentimes suffering when it becomes you know, very easy to prosecute a war for many, many years with no one feeling it at home, that leads to more war. When it becomes very easy to, for instance, prosecute a massive assassination and bombing campaign in a place like uh, the tribal areas of Pakistan, um, when there are no pilots really who are flying those missions, um, when we keep it all secret, that leads to the, the, increased use of that tool and the end user in Pakistan is, you know, it's more death in the tribal areas. Um, so again, that I say is an example of how technology can, instead of uh, sanitizing war, can actually make war even more messy. So they're great. There's a question here in the chat. So I want to pick it up and this is for anybody. Um, the question is from uh, Johan Anderson about um, autonomous weapons, autonomous lethal weapons. Um, you know, this is, um, you know, on the horizon, if not present soon, um, as uh, part of the way we think about use of kinetic force. Um, how do you how do you evaluate a move like that? Is that a place where perhaps they should be prohibited? Um, this is the wrong direction for um, technology and, and force or is there a role? Elliot, just I know you're. This is your field, so maybe we could. Start. Oh sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it. I think it very much depends on the weapon system. Um, you know, I recently read a magazine profile of a company called Shield AI, and uh, Shield AI, uh, basically, it, you know, they make they're a drone manufacturer, and their sort of flagship platform was a quadcopter that could go in and clear rooms. So if you're, you know, fighting in an urban area, their quadcopter will just go into the room, map the room for the people who want to find out if there's anyone in that building who's a threat and tell you if there's a threat there. You know, in many respects, saving lives, right? Because that means that a, a soldier or Marine doesn't have to enter that room and get shot. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so you might say, well, that's a great force protection measure. At the same time, when you talk to them in the vision, and I think the DOD vision of this of this capability was, you know, they had their quadcopter, but there's software on that quadcopter that is AI reliant. And that same software could be applied to swarms of, uh, of aerial drones, uh, maritime drones that could be armed, not armed. So again, it depends on the ways that these AI platforms uh, spin off, whether or not they make and how we use them, and whether or not they make war more or less lethal. Um, so again, it's, you know, you have to, I think you have to play these systems through, but I think the idea that we would be fighting wars where, you know, one side arms where both sides are armed with robots, the robots go to war and whoever's robots wins, wins the war. I think you're probably, you know, we, we might be missing a step there, you know, is, is human will, I mean, we, human will is what wages war. So does the side whose robots lose, do they then decide that they're just going to allow themselves to be taken over, invaded, whatever the end game is, or do they then resort to other majors to continue the conflict? And, you know, and, and we don't know that. Uh, that obviously involves political factors that are specific to this hypothetical war. Yeah, no, oh, that's great. That's helpful. Ned, maybe I'd come back to you. I'm curious for how you think about technologies to be developed or perhaps even prohibited. Um, you know, these are, these are choices, right? How do you think about that? You know, your opening remarks seem to suggest there are some Roads we just shouldn't go down because they're self-defeating. Um, so on the on the issue of AI, I, I thought what Alia had to say there was was fascinating, and I, I'm s sympathetic. Um, in, in some respects, it seems like if we're going to develop these weapons, and those weapons are going to uh, reduce uh, violence and death, and if they're going to be more discriminate and uh, prevent collateral damage and so on and so forth, then how could you possibly be against it? Um, but on the other hand, I thought it was interesting that uh, Elliot appreciates the fact that uh, if we can prosecute these ongoing wars without sustaining uh, costs back home, um, then we're more likely to, to prosecute these wars. So I'm just wondering about the, the interaction between these two things. So. Is it a possibility, and I guess this is a question back to, to Elliot, um, uh, is it a possibility that by introducing these technologies, what we essentially do is we reduce the costs associated with war making even further? So, so for example, today we've got drones, these drone pilots, uh, sometimes they still get PTSD and moral injury because of the things that they see through the camera. So that's still a cost, okay? But once we, we, we replace the drone pilot with AI, you don't even have that cost anymore, right? So, so I can see the, the advantage to, to having these technologies. Like I say, who, who could be against the technology, the, the uh, implementation of which will lead to less coll collateral damage and unnecessary suffering? That's great. But at the same time, it seems to feed back into what you were saying about well, the, the easier we can prosecute wars without really feeling it at home, the more likely we are to do it. So do you have any thoughts on that? I think it's, it's like, right, you have to play it through. So it's, you know, if we understand war as a construct is basically one group of people imposing their will, typically a political will, on another group of people, and we use this example of drones, you know, at the end of the day, you might have a situation where Yes, we have a totally desensitized system. We have AI, AI powered drones. So there's, you know, from our, from one side's vantage, there's zero collateral damage. But obviously there can't be two sides that are fighting a war where there's absolutely no damage because then you don't have a war because then you're no longer imposing your will on someone unless you have a war where the ground rules of the war are, are whoever's robot army wins, wins the war. And we all just sort of see that then whatever's gonna happen happens whether we want it to happen or not. And typically, you know, when we look like that's not in human nature, people then just resort to less uh, technologically advanced forms of resistance. Um, you know, I do a lot of work as a journalist and I covered the war in Syria. And uh, one of the stories I did was I was down on the Turkish Syrian border and I met with a member of Al Qaeda who fought in the same part of Iraq I had fought with and fought in. And we were sort of the two, uh, two veterans talking about our respective wars. Um, and at one point he quoted, um, you know, this is guys of 
card carrying member of Al Qaeda in Iraq, he quoted Einstein to me, which I thought was very interesting. And he said, you know, Einstein predicted everything that has happened. And I said, well, what did Einstein say? He said, well, you know, Einstein said, you know, the third world war will be a nuclear war, but the fourth world war will be fought with sticks and stones. And that's how we defeated you in Iraq with sticks and stones. And in many ways, he was right. You know, in every, in every facet, we had the technological superiority, but they had the will to sit there and fight with very, very low tech weapons. So I just don't think that, I think the belief that there is a technological solution to, to war um, in some ways, I'm, listen, I'm of the belief that it doesn't necessarily align with the way human beings um, behave when another group is trying to force their will on them, that they will continue to resist in low tech ways. Yeah, right. Thanks. This is great. There's a, a comment in the chat from our friend Cheney Ryan, um, and I'll just read it uh, for you. He says the United States has the most powerful military establishment in the history of the world. It was recently defeated by Afghanistan uh, in Afghanistan by the Taliban, a force of about 80,000 soldiers. What does this say about the efficacy of war building? as traditionally understood, right? And this is the point I think, Ned, that you were trying to make about, um, you know, what, you know, the costs and also what the yield has been uh, recently. I don't know if you had a comment on that, on that comment. Um, so ever since the withdrawal of, of troops from Afghanistan, I've been following the commentaries uh, very closely and one view seems to be that um, this war was lost because we didn't have the right strategy, because the soldiers weren't properly resourced and equipped, and so on and so forth. So uh, the idea being that the military, it, it might have been successful, or it would have been successful, uh, had the armed forces only been properly supported uh, given the proper strategies and so on and so forth. Um, so the implicit assumption in play is that these operations can be executed successfully as long as we use the military in the right kind of way. Uh, whereas I'm a little bit skeptical about the winnability of some of these conflicts. Uh, I think we should just make peace with the fact that like all institutions, there are things that our armed forces just can't accomplish. It strikes me as naive to think, you know, we sent our soldiers with their guns into Afghanistan to do nation building and they failed. Next time we send our soldiers with their guns into a country for nation building, well, they succeed if they just follow these different rules and principles that we set for them. To me, it just shows a, a kind of stubborn faith in the military institution that isn't particularly well justified. And I've, I've seen some of this in some of the latest research in confidence and trust in the military forces that has come out of the US, in fact, where uh, you ask most people, how do you appraise the recent operations in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, that the American Armed Forces have been involved in? And most people will say they were failures. Then you ask people uh, if there was a another such operation in the future, how do you rate the military's prospects of success? And they rate it very highly. So continued failure, failure seems to have no, no more bearing on anticipated prospects of su success. So confidence in the military has become rigid. It, it's kind of become impervious to disconfirming evidence. Um, so yeah, I, I think, and, and there's all sorts of explanations, fascinating explanations given for, for the fact that the military is in this unique position where regardless of performance, regardless of perceived performance, confidence and trust uh, remains high. One of the explanations that I can recall is something along the lines of, uh, well, nobody wants to say that they don't have confidence in the military because that would express ingratitude or something like that. So as a result of this, uh, people still cling to the view that regardless of what happened in Afghanistan, regardless of what happened in Iraq, it can happen a thousand times over. Uh, 
people are still going to feel as though or they're going to at least assert that as long as we prepare the, the military properly, equip it properly, give it the right strategy, it will succeed. There's nothing our boys can't do. Um, whereas I think there are just limits uh, of, what, of what armed force can achieve. And that's my reading of Afghanistan. It's not that the military wasn't given the right strategy or properly prepared. It's just that the military is not good for certain things. Great thing. Nita, did you want to jump in on any of those points? Yeah, let me just say that about uh, Afghanistan, I think it shows that the defense, as Clausewitz said, has the advantage that um, the, the side that has further to go is inherently weaker uh, and that's not the fighting to defend what is theirs or controlling what is theirs it has a less morale um, in order to win in Afghanistan, Trump said it best, the United States would have had to use a heck of a lot more force. He used some expletives, I think. But in other words, the U.S. would have had to really destroy uh, um, Afghanistan in a way that, that it, it managed not to do over the last 20 years. But I, I want to get step back from that for a moment and, and go back to this the other thing that Ned just said, which is really interesting, which is why is it, he asks why, is it that uh, the military, any military could keep failing and people still have faith in it? And I think it's because the militarist beliefs underlying um, most societies mean that we don't, we don't see the problem as the, the assumptions are wrong, but that we haven't tried hard enough. Basically, it's always um, try harder, hit harder. And um, what, I, what I think the assumptions that we see are, are First of all, that force can be quick, or it's quicker than the alternatives, or that it can be controlled better than the alternatives, or that um, you will um, be able to do something more cheaply than the alternatives, or that uh, it's going to be um, uh, the case that once hit, the other side will back down, they'll roll over, uh, that, that, that they respond to superior force. And, and we see time and time again in history is that those assumptions are uh, often wrong. And then when states, you know, say, you know, as they did in the war of 1812, the, you know, the war is gonna be done in a few months, we'll be back and we'll have taken all this territory in Canada, where they say this during the civil war that it'll be very quick and the South will give up or the, you know, World War I, World War II, things can happen quickly. Um, it will be home before the snow falls. All of those assumptions about speed are wrong because people resist. And um, then this, these other assumptions about the controllability of force, um, that there won't be any escalation uh, or not escalation that we don't predict, um, that's often wrong. So the assumptions about force itself need to be questioned historically. And uh, I, I think then we'd see that, I'm sorry, there's a cat who lives here. Um, I'm not at my house and I can't get rid of the cat. Um, we see that uh, looking through past conflicts that we've often overestimated the utility and the capacity of force to get the job done. Right. And that in those, in those instances um, where force has worked, it has been at great cost. So for instance, yes, the Germans won against the Herero and the Nama in Southwest Africa because they killed 50 to 70% of the people there. And, uh, yes, the United States won against native peoples, but that's because they decimated or, and committed genocide. So, um, yes, force can work if you're prepared to kill a lot of people. But in today's context, we don't believe that that's legitimate. And in fact, it, it, because we don't believe it's legitimate, it creates a backlash. And when that happens... <laughs> I think we, uh, when that happens, it's, it's, uh, it's counterproductive as well for the side that's, that's using force. So that, Nita, that's great. Let me take another sort of another lane into this, this conversation here. And maybe, um, you know, it's time to think a little bit more expansively about what we even mean by security. And maybe you're right. I mean, maybe the, maybe Andrew Carnegie was right a hundred years ago and three world wars later, but you know, the mean industrial war may be behind us, right? That that kind of those scenarios of, you know, massive uses of force 
um, using technology in such a way. And what we're actually looking at now is um, this weird space, you know, where we're in conflict, but not necessarily war. And here I'm getting at um, cyber, right? You know, active measures, disinformation, um, you know, this is, this is kind of where the action is right now, right? It's in, it's in this sort of gray space um, and in the margins. And that, you know, if you look at, um, you know, where the attention is going now, it's going into, you know, cyber protection um, and it's going into these new theaters like, you know, outer space, you know, things like this, right? So, um, you know, may, maybe, maybe we're moving on. Um, what, what do you all make of that? Um, and if we're moving on, um, you know, are we making a mistake by sort of militarizing these, these new theaters, if you will, whether it's cyberspace and outer space? And we're kind of looking at it in, in the security, um, in the security. So it's, it's non-kinetic to use, you know, what you were talking about, Nita. It's not, you know, it's not traditional, but it's, it's conflict uh, and perhaps even war. And it's going to be militarized in a sense. It seems like, it seems to me like that's happening now. I'm yeah. curious what you, what you all think of that. Could, could I just begin with what, what we spend sure. the money on? Yeah. Uh, when you look at a, uh, the military budget, much of it is spent on personnel and that's not gonna go away, right? That's the bulk of military spending. Then there's procurement for all that kinetic stuff. And also um, to, uh, you know, have the bases functioning. So much of it is, a, is about the, the built infrastructure and the capacity to use force. There is um, a, a, actually a relatively small portion of it that goes towards what you might call these exotic things like space war and, um, you know, cyber and so on. That's a really small part of it. Basically what we believe in the, and the budget follows the beliefs about the utility of force is that um, the threats that the United States and other states want to prepare for, should prepare for, are you know, somebody rolling over your border, or you want to go there with your long-range aircraft and control territory, or your aircraft carrier. That's, that's basically we're stuck there. And in terms of those new threats, um, I, I believe that it's uh, just exactly as you said, Joel, we're militarizing things that don't necessarily need to be militarized. I believe that there are threats that could become material with cybersecurity, and we've seen that. But uh, that doesn't mean that putting the, our eggs in the military basket is going to answer those threats. And that the, the real security issues, if we want to talk about the meaning of national security or any kind of security, are existential and are human security. And that those are the things that are going to kill more people in the next 50 to 100 years than much of what we've already been talking about, these exotic things, right? And they're becoming, um, uh, I think, less important, actually, than the threats posed by inequality by, and by um, rising seas where most of us live on the coasts and by extreme temperatures, uh, too little water, and eventually famine, right? And that now, the, what, the, what the DOD does with the threat of climate change is then they move to, okay, then migrants are coming to a neighborhood near you and you must be prepared to defend yourself. And they say that it will um, lead to conflict. Again, uh, you know, assuming, as Elliot seems to, that human nature is such that we cannot deal with scarcity in any other way than by brute force. But um, I, I think that if, if we want to make that world, we can. Right, but there are other paths that we could use to defend ourselves uh, in in that in those coming scenarios. I think which are much more likely than some of the scenarios we've just been talking about. Yeah, great. I want to turn to Elliot. Elliot, what do you think? Are, are we and just going back to sort of the technology issue as well? Is just a, two things. One is, are we militarizing everything? Um, you know, whether it be cyber and outer space. And then also, I don't want to lose track of Nita's last point too about these sort of maybe non-traditional security threats in sense of whether it's climate or, you know, we should also just mention the pandemic, by the way, if you're looking at casualty numbers, right? Um, so just a couple of things to keep in mind. Yeah, I listen, I think if you look at the war, if you look at the world right now, I think there are, I mean, 
very clear threats to U.S. interests abroad by nation states that uh, are in no way um, part of broader sort of, you know, human trend line factors and climate change. You know, you know, you know we have Xi, President Xi has been very, very clear for a very, very long time about his intents with regards to Taiwan. That is going to be a question that the United States and our allies will likely have to reckon with inside the next 10 to 15 years. You have 150,000 U.S. troops or Russian troops sitting on the border of Ukraine. I mean, that is something that the international community is going to have to reckon with probably within the next month, two months. And maybe and maybe those issues will come to nothing. But I don't think we're living in a sort of uh, post-war world in the classic conventional sense. I mean, those are real threats. I think there's the question about militarization and whether everything should be militarized. And I think one of the things that's interesting is to see how the DOD is metabolizing these, you know, these sort of asymmetric, I'll just call them asymmetric capabilities they need to develop, such as space and cyber, and how they're recruiting into the force. Um, you know, my you know, my parents serviced the Marine Corps. Uh, General Berger, the commandant, just uh, released new personnel guidance, for instance, talking about how the Marine Corps is looking to allow Marines to come into the service who will have never had to go to boot camp and who will be able to stay at their duty stations longer. All of these measures are acknowledgement of the fact that, you know, it's not going to be 19 and 20 year old Lance Corporals and Corporals necessarily who are the essential entity in the next fight. It's going to be older, more mature people, people who are cyber savvy, people who don't want to live that classic Marine life. And we need to afford towards that. I think, you know, with regards to, you know, how we view war um, and uh, there are, there is a whole spectrum that exists with how we fight wars. Um, you know, at the, at the risk of quoting uh, Donald Rumsfeld in this conversation, I will quote him and say, you know, he famously said, uh, all generalizations are false, including this one. Um, but we see, you know, we remember, listen, we remember the big wars that go very, very poorly, obviously, First World War, Second World War. Um, and oftentimes we, in the long term, you know, forget the short wars that go fairly well, that seem to achieve their objectives. I mean, in the near term, I'm thinking the Persian Gulf War, the intervention in Panama, the intervention in Grenada, the Franco-Prussian War of the 1870s. I mean, these are wars that seem to work. Now, the challenge is you can very much show the intellectual connection between those rapid wars that achieve their political objectives and then a similar bid to have a rapid war that completely turns into a disaster. I mean, you can draw a you could draw a straight line from the Franco-Prussian War of 1871 to the First World War and the belief that it would look like the Franco-Prussian War and then it didn't. I think you can draw a straight line to the Persian Gulf War and our war in Iraq. Oh, the Shia, the Shia will greet us as liberators because they all revolted against Saddam. But to believe that war only were, I, I don't think history teaches us and shows that the only way wars are ever successful when is when there is massive, massive disproportionate slaughter. Um, you're ignoring a whole category of wars. And it's important to understand those wars, not because in a Pollyannish way, it's like, oh, we should do more of them. It's because no, oftentimes we go to war assuming very hopefully that that is going to be our experience. And if you think about it in any war, um, miscalculation is baked into absolutely any war because typically both sides believe they're going to win and both sides can't necessarily win a war. So someone um, has miscalculated. And I'll just say just, just a, a last point because we were talking a little bit about Afghanistan. Um, I think it's important to mention this, you know, a truism of Af Afghanistan, uh, I think amongst anyone who was there was, um, was often said that the, the Americans had the watches and the Taliban had the time. And I think one of the challenges, and you know, if I were to quip on why we lost that war, is because the United States was never able to have both the watches and the time. And by time, I don't actually necessarily mean physical time. I mean the you know the political will and wherewithal and capital to actually win that war. And um, and there were very real political reasons why that war you know couldn't be won. Uh, and oftentimes we we uh, we undercount. Um, the political. So I think it'll be very interesting to see how cyber um, and space 
factor into future conceptions of war. They are obviously, if you know, if the United States or any other nations attack, there is going to be a cyber component of that. I mean, you know, look at solar winds from last year, where 400 out of the 500 Fortune 500 companies were hacked into. I mean, that is a real threat. I think it needs to be accounted in our national security. Whether or not the best way to do that is under the Department of Defense or other under administrative structures is to be seen. But I think, um, to quote the novel, The Leopard, if any of you have read it, which is a favorite, uh, one of the truisms of that book is, uh, you know, everything must change so that everything can stay the same. <laughs> Good. So, so let me just yeah. correct one thing, though. Um, Elliot, I didn't say that massive slaughter is the only way you win a war. What I was saying is that oftentimes wars escalate um, because the other side resists. And when they resist, you keep applying force. And what happens sometimes is then that force gets to an extreme, which is what happened in the case of Southwest Africa. Um, but what we have today is a culture, an international milieu that says slaughter is not okay in, on that scale. Now, um, that's why wars tend to drag out today because countries are not willing, thankfully, to go to that extreme. And then uh, you made the point yourself that sometimes short wars look successful and yet they, they lay the seed, they lay the ground for the next conflict. Um, but but what, I, what I wanna ask is, um, is how it is, and I think Ned will probably wanna come in on this, how it is that, that Afghanistan could have succeeded, right? Or any, any war like it, because in, um, in 2018, 2019, the US went again with massive air power to try to defeat the Taliban, to try to destroy it. And yet throughout um, that period, the Taliban kept taking back territory, right? They kept expanding. So the application of massive amounts of air power, and there were different periods of so 2000. Seven, there was massive air power. 2014, I think it was, there was massive air power against the Taliban, yet they, they kept taking territory. What, what would have worked? And would the hearts and minds have worked better? But if, if you pair hearts and minds with uh, military force, how is that a recipe for success if what you end up doing is killing civilians? Um. I don't, I don't believe that the United States ever in any type of coherent way articulated what victory in Afghanistan looked like. So I can't think of any administration that laid out what its goals were in Afghanistan in a clear way. So when you say, well, you know, how could we have won? I don't necessarily know how to tell you what, what winning looked like. Um, I can unpack a number of what I believe are, you know, were critical strategic mistakes that you know, didn't allow the United States to find an off ramp where success was plausible. Look for this, you, you, you may or may not remember, like in 2003, there were pieces and editorials written in the lead up to the war in Iraq that we had won in Afghanistan. Afghanistan was over. Sure. I mean, I was in the, I was, you know, I was an active duty military officer at that point. I remember those conversations. Um, you didn't want to go to Afghanistan. There was nothing to do there. So um, at that point, you know, we left and we went to Iraq. Obviously, a massive mistake that set the conditions for the Taliban to reconstitute in 2005 and 2006. I do think the idea that, um, you know, listen, oftentimes the, narr the narrative is quickly becoming, well, we walked away from the Afghan government and the Afghan military. And the fact that it collapsed is proof of the fact that it was never a that never in any way viable. And I think that's a little bit a little bit rich, seeing as it ignores the fact that the Taliban have massive external support from the Iranians and the Pakistanis to include a safe haven over the border in, in Pakistan. If Iranian and Pakistani support suddenly evaporated for the, for the Taliban, they received none of that material support and were confined within the borders of Afghanistan, you'd have had a very different outcome, I believe, or let me just say, you would have had a very different situation in Afghanistan. Um, so I just think it's important to keep all of those um, variables in mind. And I, and I apologize if I misheard you okay. um, before. Uh, you know, listen, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in no way uh, a, a pro-war guy. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, no fan of war. Um, 
I just, uh, I, th I think that these, that these issues uh, of war and peace, um, you know, well, let me I, I have my way where I think it's, it's important to, you know, to look at them at all times. And I'm not saying anyone here is not doing this uh, for the, um, for, for, you know, for what they are in our, in our human history. Um, um, and to, you know, just be careful that in our aspirations, and I have the aspiration to, uh, to end wars as well. You know, I have a, a nine-year-old son who's very interested in serving someday in the military, and I really hope he does so in a time of peace. Um, but that, that, that our, our aspirations are, are properly fused up with the realities of what we're working in um, so that we, you know, so that we do get that outcome of, of less wars. That's good. Let me let me introduce um, another another theme, and Ned, maybe I'll go to you because this comes up in your um, in your book. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between the military and the potential of militarization and the health of democracy. Democracy itself, right? There's something there's something there, um, um, and so I, it was already discussed here that you know in the United States we have. Uh, Voluntary force. It's a relatively small, relatively small group of professional soldiers. Um, how does this figure into our thinking about where we need to go? And where I'm going here is, um, you know, is it just now is military and militarization in some ways sort of a, a profession, which is somehow, um, you know, finding its finding its way vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, uh, democracy is having some struggle right now, right? And, and you know, it's, it, there, there's something going on here. I'm curious how you all think about the military and the potential of further militarization and further national security state growth um, in relation to the obvious troubles that we're seeing in democracy right now. Ned, do you have some thoughts on that? I do. Bef before I share those with you, if I could just yeah comment on on the, the previous conversation because sure. i think this is a, a a sticking point um so the question is whether there are now other threats uh that have kind of displaced the threat of war as conventionally understood right. uh, as as the main threats that we need to to address i'm a little bit reluctant to generalize that these new non-kinetic threats as you call them uh uh that they're now more serious for all people in all places i have a a colleague in Israel who says that where he is, the terrorism and war are still at the top of the list. And maybe he's right about that. Um, having said that, I do agree that as a, a general rule, states these days face bigger problems than armed aggression, whether it be from foreign states or terrorist groups or whatever the case may be. And now, Elliot seems to be of the view that th there are these still these flashpoints where, where war is a, a a very live possibility uh, with with Russia on the border with Taiwan and China. Um, but on the other hand, some people have, a, a, a lot of scholars have a much more optimistic view of the way that international relations has gone. We've got this, this body of empirical research now showing that that interstate violence has kind of drastically declined over the last century. E even the Rand Corporation in, in one of its recent studies found that um, Interstate war is now a rare event, so it still does happen, but it's a relative is a very rare event, and I think that has implications. I mean, if we if we accept that, yes, it does happen. It might happen, but it's rare. Uh, if we fully appreciated, if we accepted that and appreciated, it, it has implications that I don't think we've we've acknowledged. So, for example. I think we'd look at military spending rather differently if we took that insight seriously. So there was this, there was a show on, on National Geographic, you may remember, Doomsday Preppers, where you've got these people who spend a whole lot of their time and money and sometimes organize their whole lives preparing for some catastrophic future scenario. And we look at that and we think, well, that's bizarre. And it's kind of sad for these people to sacrifice so much in the here and now, just in case of an event that will almost certainly never happen. Well, uh, if if interstate war is as rare as now as some of these scholars claim it is, and if we appreciate just how much we sacrifice in order to be permanently prepared for these flare-ups, we'd probably recognize that military spending in a lot of places for a lot of countries is essentially a kind of doomsday prepping 
writ large. So it's just about the kind of uh, relative likelihoods of these various problems that we face and whether it's problematic to be investing so much of our resources into this one when the scholarship, scholarship suggests that it's, it's really in decline. Anyway, so coming back um, <laughs> to your other, re re remind me, Joel, your question was, well, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in sort of, you know, how this conversation maps on to, you know, challenges we're seeing in democracy right now, right? We, you know, we've got, you know, highly skilled, you know, mm. technologically driven and growing in some ways military um, at a very high level of performance and professionalism, performing vital tasks. But yet it's somehow, yeah. I, I just wonder, um, it seems disconnected in some way from yeah. the body politic, or is there a danger of this in some way? Um, yes, there's a lot to say here. And I think Netta Crawford is probably the best person to comment on this, given her work on the relationship between, between democracy and, uh, and, and war building. Um, I've got a few th thoughts of my own, perhaps, First, I'll say something about the relationship between, between military communities and the civilian population in democratic countries. So I know in Australia, civilians, most civilians are very positively disposed towards our armed forces personnel. Soldiers are very highly trusted and regarded and respected, adored almost. Um, and I believe something very similar over there in the US. But, but on the other hand, the way that military personnel feel about the civilian population uh, is a lot more mixed. So sometimes it's, it's kind of resentment bordering on hostility, even hatred. There was this, uh, back in the 90s, there was this American journalist whose name I've forgotten. He spent some time with the Marines. And what he noticed is uh, his words were they had a private loathing for public America. So the, the analysis in that piece suggested that it had something to do with the conflict between military values and democratic values. Uh, so in democratic societies, you'll often see civilians embodying values that the military sees as pathetic and detestable. Um, and so that opens up this cultural gap between civilians and the military. And I think that's quite an interesting and potentially worrying phenomenon. It's like having a, a personal bodyguard that doesn't think very, very highly of you. So, so that, that's one tension that, that you get between militarization and democracy. The fact that the values associated with these two things come into conflict. And so are this uh, tense pairing. Uh, th there's another thing I've been wondering for a while. And every time I, I sh share this thought with people, they tend to dismiss it, but I'll throw it at you and see what you think. So even it's one of the defining values and projects of liberalism that all individuals should be afforded the same rights and protections. No country could properly call itself a liberal democracy if it didn't aspire to that. And yet we're constantly told that, so if you, if you look at most any modern military, the people in the military don't have the same rights as the rest of us. So for in any civilian occupation, even if it's a dangerous occupation, if I'm a construction worker, I've agreed to a risky job. If I show up to work, and I, the boss tells me to do something which I know will kill me, I can say no, okay? I always have the right to refuse those imminently dangerous directives. Not so in the military, you can't say no. Uh, you can only say no to uh, orders to commit war crimes and victimize civilians, but there's no scope for self-regarding disobedience. So it just seems like there's a, there's a tension there between on the one hand, we think liberal democracy is all about equal rights for all. But on the other hand, we think that in order to have a military, even if it's a professional military where it's all volunteers, for that institution to be effective, the people within it must be effectively walled off from some of the rights that 
define liberal democracy. So like I say, though, these are just my half-baked ideas. It's uh, perhaps Netta Crawford can say something more about this. Peter? Yeah, well, I think there's really two views about this, you know, whether or not the military is good for uh, democracy or whether it's actually not. On, on the, the side of the good, there's the argument that, okay, when there's high levels of militarization, that can lead to uh, an increase in rights for people who are historically marginalized. So the typical example people give is um, during World War II, women and African-Americans had increased participation in the labor force and in the armed forces because the militarization led to a need for um, greater participation among these historically marginalized groups. And so that's, that's an argument for militarization. Another argument for militarization is the idea that um, the, uh, there can be spinoffs and that there you know, economic spinoffs or that, that leads to um, the uh, uh, basically greater efficiencies, okay? Um, and then on the other hand, and this is an old one in the US where Washington and uh, Madison argued that the concentration of power that comes with long wars and of militarization is bad for democracy. In fact, it's antithetical to democracy. And the, the argument here is really about the values. You know, Washington and Madison were concerned about this concentration of power, but it's it, it ultimately are also saying that the values are, are antipodal in the sense that when it, with war, you put force on the table, force, force is always an option. With militarization, you're preparing to use force. You've said it's okay. Democracy is just the opposite. It says we'll take force off the table domestically, and we don't value force. In fact, we want to limit force to, to basically defense, self-defense, or you know, to capture criminals. And so the, the two values work against each other. And I see us in the United States as living in this sort of, um, you know, almost always on a tipping point between valuing force and everything that we think it can achieve and saying that it's legitimate. And therefore, we, you know, we, you know, we have uh, police officers who talk about a, sort of a militarized form of policing, a warrior cop mentality, that, that force comes home in that sense. And then um, we also have uh, a very concentrated form of power where, where the president can decide by him or herself to use nuclear weapons and declare war, and Congress has become quiescent. Um, you know, the, the, the War Powers Act is, is basically a dead letter. So the concentration of power and the, this uh, infusion of values, I, I believe, hurts democracy. It doesn't always hurt democracy, but, but the other, on the other hand, when you have greater uh, levels of democratization, we see um, a more uh, a, a greater willingness to, to resort to other tools such as um, uh, diplomacy or economic statecraft um, when uh, dealing with adversaries, which brings us back to, you know, what's the best way to deal with Xi and Putin? Okay, so if we militarize, we risk us looking more and more like the countries that Xi and Putin run. Um, not, not that we will necessarily, but we, we get closer to that sort of illiberal side. And um, I, I would rather not, nor do I believe that it's necessary for us to only respond to them with um, the threat of force, which is, you know, moving military forces into the Indo-Pacific Command or um, uh, threatening to use force against Putin should he st cross the line. And I think that these are very real things, but but, but we cannot destroy what it is we seek to protect um, or, or damage what we seek to protect by uh, over-militarizing. And I think in, if you live, for instance, in the inner city, or if, if you're on a Native American reservation, such as um, at Standing Rock um, or uh, the Line 3 protest, you see just how militarized American policing has become. And it is, and sadly, um, uh, peopled by many members of, of, of the force who are veterans and who 
sort of take the, the warrior mentality home. But that was a lot. Um, yeah, no, uh, I'll just yeah. I'll just stick with yeah. the concentration of power is bad. Increased secrecy is bad. And uh, the, the, the two norms yeah. are yeah. antipodal. <laughs> It's a big theme. I just want to give Elliot a crack at that. I don't know if you want to take any of this. So we talked a lot here about civil military relations, the health of our democracy. Any any thoughts you want to share on that theme, Elliot? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's a massive issue in the United States and a very much underreported and one that is uh, that is not in the forefront of Americans consciousness the, the way that at least I, I think it necessarily should be. You know, there was and, and maybe you all are aware of this. Um, you know, there's a very interesting video that became kind of a cause celeb for a couple of weeks, uh, which was the case of uh, Marine Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller who right after the Afghanistan withdrawal and the bombing at the Abbey Gate went on Facebook Live and basically in a kind of four minute, you know, tour to force demanded accountability up and down the chain of command from the Secretary of Defense to the Joint Chiefs to the Commandant of the Marine Corps. And it really, um, in this rant sort of ended his career. Uh, and I remember watching that video and I was sort of asking myself, like, like, what am I watching here? You know, is this a rant? Like, what, what is this guy doing? And I sort of sat with me for a while. And the, the word I kind of settled on describing is like this. And um, he's self-immolating. Like he basically did the equivalent of dousing himself in gasoline and lighting himself on fire, professionally speaking. And he was, you know, fired from the Marine Corps, um, lost, his, lost his retirement after 18 years. Um, and I only bring that up because, you know, there is, and this kind of maybe gets to, to Ned's point. I mean, you know, why is the U.S. military popular? You know, why does it consistently rank as one of America's most popular institutions and one that is trusted? And I would offer at least one of the contributing factors is it is one of the very few, if not the last political institutions of the United States that does not seem to have an overt political bias. It seems somewhat politically neutral, although there have been, I think, in the last few years, forces very much trying to politicize the U.S. military. So it doesn't really possess that bias yet, which is not to say that people within the ranks do not have their political biases and oftentimes heavily one way or another. But there is this, you know, this this culture or this code of omerta that, you know, you don't speak your political beliefs if you are wearing the uniform. Um, and for instance, I remember at one point, and this has always existed, but, you know, 20 years ago uh, during the 2000 elections, I was a college student and I asked a, a Marine colonel who was a fellow on campus, you know, whether he voted. And he kind of said to me, oh, no, I don't vote. Like someone might say, you know, I don't smoke. And I realized that his view was that as a military officer, he should have no say in, in who the commander in chief is, because that's not his president. That's actually, you know, the highest level of his chain of command and he doesn't vote on his chain of command which is just to say that the U.S. military has a very different relationship with political power in the United States. For the U.S. military, it's a matter of that chain of command. And as American politics gets more and more dysfunctional, I think we're going to potentially see more scenarios like the summer of 2020 or January of 2021, where there are massive stressors that are going on and the military becomes a real live wire and chip that is getting played one way or another. And I'm not saying this is a partisan. I'm just saying it as, you know, thinking out to the future. And, you know, I think we should be worried that what happens when, you know, another Lieutenant Colonel, maybe not a Stuart Scheller is in a situation, whether that's in Lafayette, Lafayette Park or in uh, around the Capitol in January and, and is told to do something and maybe he or she doesn't agree with that and goes their own way. Uh, and, and I think that is, is something we should be thinking about as a country, particularly in an environment where we have a massive civil military divide. I think it's absolutely accurate to say many people in, in the military, particularly as the military becomes increasingly uh, intergenerational, increasingly recruited from certain portions of the United States, um, and that divide widens and widens, then, you know, could you see uh, a crisis where people in the military are sort of asked to choose politically? And, um, you know, I don't say that to be alarmist, but I think, you know, we are going now in the United States, you know, from contested election to contested election, meaning that, you know, when the election happens, both sides don't just shake hands and say it's over. And each time we see these contested elections, I would say it's sort of the equivalent of, you know, drunk driving in so much as, you know, 
we've made it through 2016. Now we've made it through 2020. Now we're going to go into 2024. And yes, we've survived all of these, but like the drunk driver, you know, typically the first time the drunk driver wraps his or her car around a telephone pole, it's not the first time they went to the bar and had too many drinks. Maybe it's the third time or the fourth time or the fifth time. And uh, I think we should be very worried about the potential role um, that a large standing military has in this country, particularly where there's a massive civil military cultural divide. Because if we look back through history, um, from Caesar's Rome to Napoleon's France, like that does not end well for democracy. So yeah, just this, we're coming to the end here. So a couple of, just a couple of things to maybe wrap this up, but Elliot, that was really helpful in, you know, sort of painting the challenge of the moment. So I'm sitting here trying to think of, you know, potential sort of alternate scenarios or strategies that would lead to, you know, better outcomes. Um, and so one is sort of obvious, I'm sure a lot of people are thinking this, how do you think, um, and I, this is not just for the United States, but this would be for any country, but particularly for democracies, about public service, national service uh, with a non-military option, right? So that, but it becomes a required, or if not, maybe not required, but maybe heavily incentivized. Uh, for young people to serve their country in either a military or non-military um, way. Um, how, do you, how do you all think about that in relation to kind of where we are right now? I'll, I'll crack at it. Um, it's, it's something I've thought about. Um, I'm, I'm very much for uh, a draft, not because I'm actually for militarization. I actually, I count myself as against militarization, but I believe that a draft uh, would demilitarize us in so much as, you know, when we think of the draft, we think it's, you know, every 18 year old person has to go up and serve the military. I mean, it, you know, it, it by and large hasn't necessarily been the case. Oftentimes, you know, drafts are typically done through a lottery system and it's less, you know, necessarily the draft itself, but the specter of the draft that has real power uh, to incentivize citizens to have skin in the game. So, you know, as a thought experiment, I mean, imagine what the United States would look like if, you know, 5% uh, of, of military age young people, uh, men and women were eligible for the draft through a lottery system. I think it would potentially dramatically change, uh, our relationship to the military, how much Americans paid attention to threats abroad, because our wars would stop being something that happened over there and was happening with somebody else. Um, and I think by and large, that would have a, um, uh, uh, you know, a healthy effect uh, for our democracy. Um, that being said, I, I don't think it's something that in, in the current political climate, we, you know, we, we would likely see legislatively anytime soon. Yeah. Ned, what's the situation in uh, Australia with regard to national service? Uh, fully voluntary. Yeah. There is, there is no draft, that there is no debate about introducing it. Um, I haven't given this a whole lot of thought about whether there should be compulsory national service, military or, or non-military. And I can see arguments pulling both ways. Uh, the argument against having at least something to do with uh, liberalism and forced labor and so on and so forth. But perhaps one thing that can be said in favor of some sort of compulsory national service is it might help us deal with a problem that we're facing in countries like ours uh, of what well, Elliot says, this kind of increased political polarization uh, where people are kind of in their own echo chambers, in their own silos and, and uh, they have their own truths and their own facts and so on and so forth. Um, so one, one antidote to these kinds of social cleavages is just more, more interaction among people that wouldn't otherwise interact. So I think psychologists call this the, the contact effect or something. So if you're kind of hostile towards a group of people, you've got certain prejudices towards them, preconceived uh, ideas, simply interacting with them on an ongoing basis is going to, uh, is going to correct some of those prejudices or, or, or get rid of them. Um, the problem is left to their own devices, people will, primarily mix with people that are just like themselves, right? So social groups tend to be uh, uh, homogenous in, in, in that way. So compulsory national service may be 
uh, well, one of the, the, the benefits that I could see is that it would have the effect of uh, getting people to mix with demographically diverse others. And that might kind of break down some of these, these social, cle the, the social cleavages. The, the workplace, the ordinary workplace used to perform this, this role. People uh, have to work to make a living. Uh, and so for the sake of earning their salary, that they'll go into an organization where they're forced to cooperate with people that they wouldn't otherwise uh, uh, have anything to do with. Uh, and that would have this effect. But because of the, the way that the labor market has gone, uh, the, the workplace isn't performing that role as well as it once did. And perhaps that's part of the reason why we are seeing this, this social polarization. So I, I think there's something to be said for national service as an antidote to this growing problem of polarization in society, uh, the sure. divisions we're seeing. Thank you, Nita. Did you want to weigh in on that? that? Yes, I think that what we have right now is essentially the poverty draft, right? So for many people, military service is a way to get what they see as potential, um, you know, education or training, or um, it's a way to avoid prison. Uh, it's a way to, to get them out of a situation that um, where it's what they perceive as more violent than they would be in the armed forces. So uh, national service that's alternative, that provides some of those same benefits as military service would actually be quite beneficial. So that's the only way I'd like to see a national, it's a voluntary situation where, where it's an alternative to military service where you get the same kinds of benefits. So for example, um, you know, if somebody were to be, to uh, go to uh, a sort of, um, uh, you know, teacher service on steroids, we have national teacher service as a potential, right? AmeriCorps. But if it were um, actually boosted so that if you chose to be a public school teacher in um, a poor neighborhood for 10, 15 years, then you get you know, better benefits. So that basically what you have with the military is a fantastic jobs program. You get healthcare for life, TRICARE, healthcare for life. You get, um, often you get training um, that's valuable to you. Sometimes you get preferential hiring um, as, a, as a consequence of your service. The, the pay could be better. And it, in fact, the military is getting a large raise this year in the National Defense Authorization Act. But it's actually a fairly good deal. And I, I think that's an, another reason why it's, it's popular um, amongst, among people who don't see themselves as having other options. Um, you know, if, if we had this national service, in other words, Joel, I, I, I think it would be excellent, but I wouldn't like to see it as something that is required. We're coming to the end of our, our 90 minutes, so I'm gonna bring it to a conclusion. Did anybody have anything that they wanted to share before we formally adjourn? I, I just wanted to, yeah. to question the notion that the pr greatest provocation is weakness. Um, it, it's, it seems to me that there are many ways to understand the causes of war. And some of the, the, uh, the provocations do come from uh, uh, having an aggressor who sees a weaker side right, and wants to take advantage of that. But I think historically, um, often the aggressor aggresses whether or not they see the other side as weak, they choose to see their chances of victory as strong. Um, right. And so I'll, I'll leave it at that. And I have lots of historical examples, but there oh, you go. Ellie, yeah, Elliot, maybe we'll have another session. Elliot, did you want to speak just to that? I just, I just like to speak to one point because I think it's sure. very important sure. and probably germane to a lot of what we're talking about. Yeah. I think this idea that the military is a poverty draft. Um, in addition to being, I think, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna use a strong word here, patronizing to people who've served in the military does not represent our armed forces and the people who serve in the ranks, many of whom are very accomplished, very dynamic people, and people who come with many options and choose and to elect to serve in the military. And I believe that type of thinking is in many respects evidence of the civil military divide that exists yeah. in the country. 
Um, and, and, and yes, the pay is not good, but additionally, you know, you serve in the military, you actually, you don't get uh, health care for life. You have to retire 20 years to get health care for life. You get VA medical care, which is, which is, uh, less than ideal, uh, if you serve four years, but I think that, you know, that belief, uh, and when people who come out of the military, uh, and are looking for jobs, and have done four years going to a workforce and a labor force where people believe that they went into the military because they had no other options mm. is what yeah. creates a lot of the resentment that veterans feel to the society for which they served. So I'll just right. Finish. Right. So Elliot, my apologies. What I, I, I have a cousin who's a brigadier general. I don't think he went into the military because of, uh, for, because he was poor. That might be part of the reason uh, he went to serve. Many people go to serve. And but what I what I do see is that that uh, it is perceived and is used by many people as a way to get out of a situation to get better options and be, and that's because the military does provide better options than than they might otherwise have. All right. So and and I think your point, it's one of the great drivers of social mobility that's existed in this country for a long time. And regardless of wars, successful or failed. Um, that is a good thing that the United States military uh, has done. It's been an engine of social mobility in many cases. Great. With that, I'm going to call us to, uh, to a conclusion. I want to thank all of you for um, your many contributions. Uh, Ned, thank you for you know, the symposium in the journal and Nita for your participation. Elliot, thank you for answering the call. It's been a really good conversation. I know that a lot of the Carnegie Council constituents feel like we do that we are at an unusual moment right now with these issues. You know, again, with the conclusion of the war in Afghanistan or the US withdrawal from it, um, and some of the issues that we're all facing together now globally, um, that this is an important moment. And Carnegie Council tries to play a role here in identifying people just like you who are willing to share your thoughts and experiences and to do it in such a um, you know, honest and reflective way. Uh, really, thank you for, for doing that and thank you for sharing it. Um, just for any of you who are listening, you can um, come to Carnegie Council website. There are a lot more programs like this one, videos, podcasts, transcripts, some resources to continue to think through some of these issues. And uh, we'll be reconvening um, shortly to pick up on some of them. So with that, uh, we'll adjourn. Thank you very much and hope to see you all again soon. Thanks Thank so much you. for the opportunity. Thank you.